You know that feeling you get down there when a hot girl walks by? Or a hot boy, there's no shame. I got exactly that feeling when you commented on my recent WRX report. I'm feeling it right now. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Aussie new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. In this report, the abductee's guide to escaping from a locked WRX boot. That's a trunk in America. Plus, the compelling case for performance cars. They're actually safer. And how to do a racing style heel and toe downshift like a gear changing frickin' ninja. All suggested by you, which is why I love you in that entirely platonic, non-fag way. My recent 2018 WRX review enraged or engorged some of you, maybe both. There's an image to consider. Shed Looney says, John... I love you, but drawing on the Rex is seriously messing with my OCD. Twitch, twitch. I did draw on the Rex, and Subaru was thrilled, naturally. I did this with the greater goal of explaining the law of diminishing returns with performance cars, which I prefer to think of in inverse terms, the law of bang for your buck, in which the Rex punches so well above its own weight. Regular correspondent Ellis Mir Wildwood also chimed in on this. Two problems. Number one, after you finish drawing your graph on the door of this pristine new white car, you look down and realise it's not a whiteboard marker. Yes, there is that. Clearly, this is a measure twice, cut once, Consideration. Note to self, get the pens right next time. Mr. Wildwood goes on. Number two, all the possible Murphy's Law scenarios associated with locking yourself in the boot alone on a country highway. I suspect he's talking about this. You know, I did briefly consider the joy of locking myself Pulp Fiction gimp-like into that boot. But happily, the Rex is a poor choice of transportation for the serial abductor of his fellow man or woman. There's a physical boot latch release inside the boot. It's a plastic T-shaped handle and it's even luminous because... Subaru thinks of everything. Plus, I folded the big half of the rear seat down just in case, and I used the remote release on the fob. And naturally, I had my phone with me, but I was philosophically disinclined to call the cops and explain the predicament, and then wait patiently for rescue with 10,000 bucks worth of camera gear sitting there on the verge, and the sons of anarchy riding past routinely in Shitsville. Risk management. Yes. Here's Stig on YouTube. Woo, a lot of camera tricks and angles going on there. And who was driving the car when you athletically got out of the boot? Hee hee, hee hee, hee. Well done, John. Getting out of the boot like a prat is really just a piss take on car reviews and TV news and current affairs generally. Like, I see all these wannabe car reviewers, these TV types, And they take it all so friggin' seriously. They fake up their own importance and the faux gravity of the medium and what they're doing with it. And in my view, that is always a fail. So the piss take stuff is just me philosophically flipping the bird to the concept of self-importance in car reviews and in news generally. R.L. Ajito says, John, did you crawl into the trunk from the inside? Lol. Saw the car dip gradually. Is you made your way in there? Okay, so I stop well short of undignified crawling. I just don't do that and it's in my contract, all right? 
you just drive up, you stop the car, you shut down, get out, climb in the boot, lock the lid behind you, you pause for a bit, and then you hit the boot release and you clamber out in that uniquely undignified piss-take way. And then you just cut out all the bits of the vision that don't fit that discontiguous narrative because everything on TV is fake. That's a golden rule. It's how this works. It's really no different to achieving the world's fastest wardrobe changes or the Darth Vader lightsaber-esque levitation trick with the big fat pair of bolt cutters. It's all fake, just like the nightly news, or teleporting yourself straight through a locked car door. Oh. All of it, a bird flipping piss take on self-important losers everywhere who are trying to do top gear and managing to do it very badly indeed. Personally, one of the great joys of doing this stuff is the, uh, the quizzical looks I get from innocent bystanders watching me shoot this crap at the roadside. Philip Beck now, he says, Well edited, sir. Who does the editing, grading and green screen background animation design in your productions? Thank you very much, Philip. That's very kind. However, I think it's fair to say that this is a somewhat leaner operation than perhaps you presume. Like that stereotypical lady of the night in Bangkok, I do airy ping. And I mean airy ping. Much less glamorous now, don't you think? As the aspiring starlet famously said to Bill Cosby, it's not that hard. I just write the script, I present it, I shoot it, I cut it, I grade it, I upload it, repeat. That's how this works. It's a lean, mean, one-man band kind of operation. So if you are looking for someone to blame for the crap audio mix or the cicadas in the background or crossing the line, whatever, look no further. Therefore, if you have ever wanted to have a crack at YouTubing yourself, there's no excuse. Because if I can do it, you most certainly can. Your first video is likely to be spectacularly crap. Mine absolutely was. But do not let this deter you. You get incrementally better. Now, a somewhat more critical comment from Paul Ross. John, you can only do the speed limit. You get to the speed limit in the city two seconds faster than most base model cars. Promoting driving fast on public roads is stupid. As much as my default setting here is to withdraw a three foot razor blade from its scabbard, the better to slice and dice Mr. Ross's viewpoint all over the plain white carpet. In the spirit of diplomacy, let me humbly suggest that you can in fact be a car enthusiast and also a safe driver. I know plenty of people who are in fact both. There's a compelling case in point of fact that performance cars are also safer cars. So at the risk of setting off Shed Looney's OCD once more, let us go live to Cletus Van Dam for more on this on location in Shitsville. So here's my theory about how performance cars are potentially safer, provided you manage not to drive like a dick. So here's a couple of axes at the risk of sounding like that physics professor who made you nod off one day in class. And this could be acceleration, and this could be braking, and this could be cornering right, and this could be cornering left, and you could be in Nana's Yaris. And Nana's Yaris might have cornering and braking and acceleration limits like that. And then you could transition immediately to the WRX and it's gonna have cornering, acceleration, braking, whatever limits, kinda like that. So you can't step over the line in any one of these directions. If you're in Nana's Yaris, you can corner precisely that hard before you lose traction. You can accelerate that hard, you can brake like that, or you can do some combination of the two. You can never go outside this circle, however. So let's say one day you're driving along quite conservatively in Nana's Yaris and you're about here, let's say you're about here in the cornering domain and all of a sudden a kid steps out or there's a kangaroo in the middle of the road and all of a sudden your pleasant drive turns into a really, really interesting afternoon. The problem with being in Nana's Yaris of course is that you're already cornering this much so you've only got 
this much braking potential because you can never step outside this circle. This much cornering plus that much braking equals there's your limit, live with it, hope you miss the kangaroo, hope you miss the kid. Now if you're in the wrecks and you're doing exactly the same cornering, you're still exactly here in cornering, all of a sudden it's your worst day, you can brake like this hard. There's a big difference between Nana's braking capacity because she's already cornering and your braking capacity in the wrecks because you're cornering but you've got a bigger friction circle so you've got more reserve. So isn't that a happy coincidence? In any of these stressful situations, provided you're driving conservatively, you've got more wriggle room in the performance car. So there's the safety case for performance cars. Unfortunately, a lot of people tend to drive their performance cars about here when in situations when they really shouldn't and of course that means that you're back to having about the same braking potential as Nana. So this extra acceleration, braking and cornering potential tied up in a beautifully engineered car like the Rex here, that's great. But if you use all of that for fun, you've got none in reserve for safety. So performance cars are potentially the safest cars on the road and whether they really are or not in your case, well, whether you've got this much braking or this much braking, kind of depends on you and the decisions you make upstream of your critical incident. Cletus Van Dam, the pink piston of Schittsville. Yes, he's available, ladies. Now, one cannot do a WRX review without some CVT critical half-wit comment like this from Studat. No one a CVT sucks and is slow. I picked up the SSB instead and I am one happy camper. I drove three WRX CVTs and they all felt gutless. Poor takeoff and poor zero to a hundred of around 6.8. No thanks. This ain't no performance car. First up, the majority of WRXs sold in Australia are CVTs. The CVT is absolutely slower off the mark, but it is wickedly responsive in gear. According to Redbook, there is 0.3 seconds difference to 100 k's an hour. The CVT is brilliant for engaging driving on a winding road, and CVT Premium is in fact the WRX that I would buy every time. And I've owned two WRXs, and I love both of them. They're bulletproof, fun cars. And I also get that Studat here bought an SSV instead. It's a muscle car, and WRX, not a muscle car. SSV is 15 grand more, and it's got a 6.2 litre V8 and rear drive, 27% more power to weight, so it's a completely different animal. Same old argument though, if a muscle car is right for you, a WRX is going to be wrong and vice versa. Horses for courses, right? SSV would hose a WRX in a straight line, but I'd give it to the WRX in the bends and in the wet, game over. WRX every time. Manish Kumavuma says, Did you double clutch at 4 minutes 48 seconds? If yes, then why? Honestly curious. He's talking about this. And one more time in case you missed it, down there. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I used two feet to operate three pedals contemporaneously, and I've been doing that for so long now that I was thinking impure thoughts about big, firm, double-D chuzzies moisturized with Dairy Whip while I did it, which I find quite therapeutic, frankly. Ron Plante noticed this process as well. Oh, John, did I see a double clutch? Nearly a waste to develop synchromesh. Nearly. How I miss using my left foot with my 30 years of autos, but then an EH with no second gear will do that to you. Well, two out of three's not bad, I guess. That was, in fact, a heel and toe downshift. Really? He's still out there. Unbelievable. Mr. Dedekishon, 2018. Thanks. 
Tutorial time! What I'd suggest you do if you want to get really good at downshifting, and in particular, really good at downshifting under pressure, I'd suggest you learn to multitask with your right leg. And that means you need to break with the ball of your foot and you need to roll the outside edge of your right foot over and blip the throttle at the same time. And basically what you can do then is a double declutch maneuver, which is essentially a change into neutral in between the downshift and a rev when that gearbox is re-engaged. Just to bear in mind, the process is on the brakes, double declutch, rev into neutral, select the lower gear and be at the right revs. Here we go. Fifth back to fourth. Slightly tighter bend coming up this time, so we're up in the revs now, four and a half in fourth, back to third. Here we go. Dead simple. Geez, that feels good when it goes in well. There you go, said the actress to the bishop. Back into fourth, here we go, braking into a tight right hander, into third, double D clutch with the brakes. Braking again, balancing it on the way around, up into fourth, and getting ready for another tight right hander. On the brakes, the blip, into third, round we go. Beautiful. I gotta say, when you're learning to do this, this is degree of difficulty 9.8. But after a while, when you've done it a few thousand times, like I just did one then, it's really easy and it's also quite satisfying because you can feel the whole powertrain going, oh, thank you for making that so easy for me. The pink piston of Schittsville there, heel and towing with those impure thoughts once again. He is a Jedi master at that, so much so that I will have a full race style downshift training guide uploaded for you in the next few days. Hours of self-loathing and anguish developing that skill, guaranteed. An excellent reason for you to subscribe to my channel right now and hit the bell notification thing while you're... Now, let us inspect Ray's Johnson. What? Let us inspect Ray Johnson. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's funny that the manual is in all versions, but the CVT is not in the STI range at all. But as mentioned in your video regarding transmission types, the CVT would allow the best part of the engine to be constantly used. So I wonder why Subaru was not made an option in the STI range. More people would actually enjoy the ride more, in my opinion. At the risk of committing STI heresy, I would love to sample the non-existent WRX STI CVT. I think that's going to be a tall order anytime soon though, but there's no engineering reason why it could not be done. The current STI is 407 Newton meters and the gruntiest CVT Subaru currently on offer is a three-way tie between the 3.6R Atmo engine in Outback, the two liter diesel and the 2.0 petrol turbo in the Rex. Those three engines all max out at 350 newton meters, and that's probably not a coincidence. It's probably Subaru Corporation's internal torque limitation on that CVT transmission. So to make a CVT STI, they need to do a spot of re-engineering on the transmission and then amortize the cost of that over the number of units that they think they might sell and then see if that is commercially viable. Anything's possible, I guess, and I know it would be a blast to drive a CVT STI, but it might not have legs commercially, so there's that. It's easy to forget that Subaru is also running a business and not just building cool cars. And finally, John C., not me, he says, I am also a bald guy who likes to wear Hawaiian shirts with shorts. Never realised how ugly that looks. Thanks. Looking at that footage retrospectively, you know, I could certainly see how someone's aesthetic sensibilities might be offended. I therefore apologise to you without reservation, and I give you my firm commitment to strive to ensure henceforth that such a fashion faux pas never happens again. You know, this really is quite pleasant in the evening breeze. Quite pleasant indeed. I'm John Cadogan. I hope this helps. Thanks for watching.